Alzheimer's disease is the most prominent form of dementia. Dementia is the umbrella term that's used to categorize Parkinson's dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, vascular dementia, etc. We know about Alzheimer's so much because 55 million people have it worldwide. That number is going to triple by the year 2050. And what we knew 20 years ago is very different to what we know now. 20 years ago, we were calling Alzheimer's disease the amyloid cascade hypothesis. That's because we knew that in Alzheimer's disease cases on neuroimaging, we could see a buildup of a certain protein. And that protein is called amyloid beta. And we all have that, right? So 20 years ago, they thought, well, if you've got a head full of amyloid beta, you've got Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, amyloid beta is the demon. But we now know that it's not the demon because it is there to serve and protect your brain. So why does it arise and where does it go wrong? In the, in the presence of inflammation or an attack on your immune system, what happens is your, your body activates our primary immune defense system, which is the innate immune system, right? And in the presence of the innate immune system in our brain, for example, your brain says, Louisa is under attack. Louisa is always under attack because she lives in Manhattan. But Louisa is under attack. We're going to release amyloid beta because amyloid beta is a protective molecule. It protects our, our brain against attacks of the outside world. So it raises it and it's like, okay, she's under attack. Let's raise, you know, it basically shields the brain from these insults. But Louisa is really great with her sleep. So Louisa goes to sleep every night at a reasonable hour. She sleeps seven and a half to eight hours per night. During deep sleep, I wash out that amyloid beta. So it gets washed out and then it's clear the following day. And that's how a healthy, plastic, really good, flexible brain should be. But in the presence of mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-dementia state, in fact, you get diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment around 20 to 30 years prior to an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. I hate the word out. I hate the word mild, uh, Jesse, because I've, I've spoken with you know, tens of thousands of Alzheimer's patients. And let me tell you, there's nothing mild about that. If you've got mild cognitive impairment, it is horrific. You can't remember really anything. We've even got before um, MCI, we've got another pre, pre-dementia pre state, which is called subjective cognitive impairment. That's when you're starting. And that's, I would say, is starting in your 30s, which is quite scary. So you've got You've got mild cognitive impairment, which then moves into Alzheimer's disease. Now, Alzheimer's disease is also uh, characterized by another protein called tau, and that builds up in the neurofibrillary tank, uh, neurofibrillary uh, of the axon, right? And what happens is when that aggregates, it basically uh, forms a tangle and it collapses the axon of the of the cell body. So you've got two things happening. You've got the protein building up inside the cell, and then you've got the amyloid, which is outside of the cell. And if it's outside of the cell, it doesn't allow for the proper functioning of these two cells to communicate with each other. So you're losing synapses. You're losing those dendrites over time. They get washed away. We call it synaptoclastic. I don't know if you've heard of blastic and clastic, but blast is basically the creation of it. So that's that's a pretty scary process. And the, the, the scariest thing about all of this is that we don't have a cure for it. We still don't know what causes it, even though I've told you, you know, partly that's what we know. And all of the FDA approved drugs like lecambi, lecanemab and donanemab, and aducanumab, these are all actually really serious drugs that when you do have them, they cause brain bleeds and uh, volume loss. We see tissue loss in, in these patients who are having it. So it's a pretty scary position to be in. All right. Now let's bring BDNF in. You mentioned how it has potential there to impact the plaques. Talk about that connection. Yeah, so when these plaques are formed, they're formed because the amyloid starts to become sticky and they and they form these these plaques, if you will. But even before that, when they're just up there circulating in the brain, serving and protecting the brain, through BDNF, through the expression of BDNF and blood flow, you can eliminate these the um, the amyloid from even becoming 
the plaque that it does. Got it. And then you mentioned sleep too, if you're getting a proper oh, yeah. sleep. Yeah. That sleep. can be part of removal in a different oh, yeah. way. The biggest part, if you will, during um, during our deep slow wave sleep, which is stage three sleep, you're really getting the clearance of not just amyloid, you're getting the clearance of the toxins that build up during the day. Environmental toxins that are just circulating in the air. I know microplastics are of big concern right now. We're even seeing microplastic build up in in the brain, which is scary because it means it's crossed the blood brain barrier and they're in there. But during deep slow wave sleep, our brain acts like a washing machine and our cerebral spinal fluid pretty much washes the brain and it takes with it the debris and it takes with it amyloid beta. So that's the best time, the best time to be cleaning the brain. So other than your basic sleep hygiene, what do we need to know in regards to sleep in connection to Alzheimer's to make sure we're getting the most out of that time? Look, you have to ensure you're getting into deep sleep. So what does that mean? Well, I think we have to take an approach of overall health, right? Sleeping at the same time every day, we know. Sleeping in a cool, dark room, fantastic. Um, you know, you want to ensure that your body is uh, two degrees lower than your maintenance level. But then ensuring that you're not doing anything to block deep sleep, such as uh, or certain medications, so certain you know SSRIs can block sleep, but sometimes we can't help help that. But light exposure, um, activation of our sympathetic nervous system through stress can kick us out of sleep. Alcohol. I mean, if you want a healthy brain and you're drinking, I mean that's first and foremost, right? That's basically like <laughs> just I don't even want to go there, really. Okay, eliminating alcohol, eliminating cigarettes, eliminating any form of drug and marijuana. Like we want to be ensuring that we are getting deep, enriched sleep at night. Well, I think we better go to alcohol because I know from that reaction, and I've heard you on other shows talk about how little it actually takes to disrupt sleep. Oh, yes. And because there is this paradox of, you know, people saying that having wine is healthy and there's certain longevity benefits. And then people like you that are saying it's terrible for our sleep and it's something to be avoided. Talk about how you see it in relation to brain health. I think to myself, if you do want a healthy performing brain, why would you be at the mercy of alcohol? You're putting yourself at a disservice in multiple ways. First of all, you've got to think about what alcohol is. Like, why does it make us, whatever it makes you, happy, drowsy, whatever it is, it's because the active ingredient ethanol is actually a toxin. It is a neurotoxin, but it's also a, you know, it, it's also a cell toxin. It, it basically turns into acetylaldehyde. And acetylaldehyde is pretty much weed killer, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you put it on your grass to kill things. So it is a, an actual... Uh, poison. And so it poisons your body, it poisons your cell. And what we've seen is that we get greater volume loss. So you are killing the gray matter of your brain. You are increasing white matter lesions. Let's just, let's just for a second, talk about white matter, for example. So you you know, 80% of autoimmune diseases are in females. And we look at, let's look at multiple sclerosis, for example. Uh, when we do, you know, you go and see a neurophysiologist, for example, you're doing something called an EMG, an electromyography. And what we're doing is we're actually testing the, the axon. We're testing conduction velocity against the, against the actual neuron. And we're testing how long does it take you to produce a muscle contraction or a thought. That's where our myelin lives. We're testing the myelin. And in multiple sclerosis, we'll see something called a complete conduction block or slow conduction velocity. That means the white matter is either deteriorating or it's just completely gone. You are adding to that when you drink. When I say white matter lesions, you are forming little lesions within the white matter, the myelin sheath of the axon. So you are slowing down the conduction velocity of your thoughts, of your information processing speed, of your movements essentially just increasing your chances of autoimmunity diseases. So there we've got that problem there. Um, but then you've got the problem of 
ethanol actually acting as a sedative. It actually sedates you. It doesn't help you sleep. I understand that it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. It kind of makes you drowsy. So people think it makes you calmer. It lowers your inhibition. And we, we, that's sometimes that can be a great thing, but that doesn't mean it's helping you sleep. So then you've got this, you've got this reversal effect. You, you're blocking yourself from sleeping because you're not sleeping. You're not clearing out the amyloid beta. And then we know that a head full of amyloid can block us from sleeping. So you've got this, you know, this, this loop, never ending loop. Any other foods or drinks in that realm people might be considering healthy and having that negative impact on the brain? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I often get asked, so Louisa, if I have to drink, what's the healthiest drink for me? I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm not sure of any other. I mean, if you're like leaning caffeine, towards caffeine, there- I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm I'm on the bandwagon of I put out a reel that went into six different studies that can show that caffeine serves as a benefit for the brain. You know, not in massive doses, obviously, and it does have a half life. So I always say to keep your caffeine prior to 12 p.m. so it doesn't affect sleep. But I don't. I, I know about any other drinks. Okay. And we're going to get into food later. I want to stay in sleep for now. How do you feel about naps? Somebody who has a bad night's sleep, hopefully not because of alcohol, but alcohol or otherwise, they're feeling tired the next day, decide to nap. How does that play into brain health for that time? And then later on when they go to sleep at night that night? Yeah. And look, uh, I, I toy with this a lot. So I work one-on-one with, um, with elite players, elite, um, uh, athletes and depending on their workload, I'll get them to have a nap. But essentially what you're doing with a nap is you're taking away from your sleep pressure. I try and caution against it because if you sleep during the day, it might be really great for you, but you're not going to be able to sleep as well at night. And what we know is that you want to be sleeping at the same time every day. Sleep regularity is now sitting at the the utmost importance for sleep, fitness, and sleep health. So unless you are extremely sleep deprived and you're going to, you're going to nap for a small amount of time, like 20 minutes, let's just say, okay, that's great. But I would definitely try and keep your, your sleep for sleep at night. Any tips for somebody who is feeling a midday crash, whether it be, you know, lack of sleep the night before, or stressful day or whatever, other than caffeine, potentially having a short nap, what do you recommend to somebody to charge up the brain and revive midday if they're feeling down and low energy? Honestly, I mean, if you are, let's just say you are well hydrated through the use of electrolytes, because electrolytes, right, when we sweat, we don't just sweat out water, we're sweating out selenium, potassium, sodium. You need, these are actual electrolytes that your cells need to function. When we produce a synapse, as I mentioned earlier, that chemical reaction, it it utilizes something called a sodium potassium pump. So we actually need, actually sometimes drowsiness is a result of electrolyte loss. So maintaining electrolytes, that's the first thing. I always have electrolytes throughout the day, making sure that you are completely hydrated. If you can get the shunting of blood to your brain, whenever I'm extremely exhausted, I'm about to like, you know, crash at my desk, I try my hardest to go outside and do a sprint or do 20 squat jumps. I don't know how well people would do. I find breath breath work can be good to quickly bring the brain back into a place of being energized and focused. Yeah, I I love breath work. And look, if people want to meditate, that's great too. I do um, 10 minutes a day of breath work as well and resonance frequency breathing where I'm doing around four to five breaths per minute. That's shown wonders on my heart rate variability and on my stress levels as well. Talk more about the meditation piece. This is a good one when it comes to brain health and obviously you're an expert in this realm. Did you say you're doing 10 minutes of meditation a day? See, I don't meditate per se, depending on what your definition of meditation is. I do. Uh, I It's a bit insane what I do, but I try and block every, all my senses and just 
sit there and breathe. Now, I believe meditation is more of a trying to eliminate all thoughts, right? I don't do that. I just I just sit with whatever I have, but I do use, use earplugs. I use a eye mask and I am just sitting there and I'm just focusing on breathing. That's all. But sometimes so I've is got, this the breath work too? Or that is my two breath work. Things? Yeah, got I don't it. do. I don't specifically do meditation. I mean, that would make that might be a form of meditation, but I'm not actively sitting there trying to eliminate thoughts. If you enjoyed that clip, you're gonna want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. Your brain cells really have this notion of supply and demand. It's under so much demand every day from work stress to environmental stress. But if you have a lot of supply through ketones and through sleep,